Betty, um, once again, Eric, this is the Housing Innovations and Energy Efficiency Stakeholder Advisory Group. Um, uh, typically, what we do here is a roll call of advisory group members um, just to see who's on the call. And I think we've been kind of doing that on, our, on a running basis here. Um, so we have uh, Narissa Turner on the line, Dewan Robinson, uh, Jonica Casper, Carmen Bingham, Casey Bliley, and Chelsea Harnish. Are there any other advisory group members that have joined that I did not get? Okay. All right, well, let's um, go ahead and get started. And, and thanks to everyone else that joined. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of, we also typically do an introduction of uh, DHCD and other agency staff that are on the call. Um, in addition to myself, um, we have Eric Johnston, the director of DHCD. We have Pam Kessner, who's the deputy director or chief deputy. Aaron Shoemaker, who is with the um, Energy Efficiency Office. Jennifer Morris, who's with the Energy Efficiency Office, is with us. Um, I saw Florin Moldovan with the Building and Fire Regulations Group. Um, any others from DHCD that I've missed? Uh, Willie's on the line. Willie, sorry. Yeah, okay. and Sandra. Okay, and then uh, we're going to give Sandra the floor to introduce herself here in a moment. <clears throat> I see Karen joined us. Karen Wilds, good morning. And let's see, Sunshine Nathan has joined us. So we've got a good number of our advisory group members on the call at this point in time. <clears throat> Well, so this is Aaron Shoemaker here. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that this call, as with the previous stakeholder advisory group meeting calls, is being recorded. So the recording and slides will be available after the meeting. Thank you, Aaron. And All right. Morning, Jan. This is Carrie Hearn from Virginia Energy uh, Sister Agency uh, for the program. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. Hi, um, Liz Beardsley. Just joined. Sorry to be late. Good morning, no everyone. problem. Okay. Good, good. Okay. <clears throat> well, Aaron, if you don't mind, let's advance to the next slide here. Um, so this is our agenda for today. Um, we are um, actually on item number three at this point in time. I think we've done... Um, Roll call, we've kind of done on a rolling basis. And then um, <clears throat> would like to um, introduce um, Sandra Powell, who is our new senior deputy director of the community development and housing divisions. And <clears throat> Sandra, if, if you'd like to just say a few words and introduce yourself briefly to the group, um, we would love that, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Sandra Powell. I'm the uh, new Senior Deputy Director for DHCD. Um, I started there in uh, late October, and I come from um, the Newport News Redevelopment and Housing Authority as a Deputy Director there. Um, many of you know Karen Wiles is also on your stakeholders group, so she's on the call, and um, so I'm just glad to be here with DHCD as well. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. All right. So, um, <clears throat> Aaron, if you'd like to advance to the next slide. <clears throat> and Eric, I should probably pause here and <clears throat> see if you would also like to say any any words at the outset of the of the call. Sure. Thanks, Dan. It's it's great to see everybody. And um, yeah, a, a welcome in uh, front of everyone to Sandra. We really have been fortunate to have uh, her join our team and the leadership she's bringing. And thank you, Karen, for being so kind. I know she did amazing things for you all in Newport News as well. So um, I, I was, want to also welcome back Kristen Dahlman, who came back from maternity leave and uh, has a new addition to the family on our policy team. So uh, I think she's on the call as well. So thanks, Dan. And, and just thanks for all everyone that's been a part of this group. Um, we'll be talking later, but I know this is our last official meeting of the stakeholder advisory group, and then we'll be moving to uh, um, uh, regular allocation meetings for all interested parties uh, moving into the next year. But just really want to thank everyone for the hard work of um, 
uh, helping us implement and design uh, the these programs. Dan, I'll kick it back to you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Eric. All right. So um, first order of business is to um, just update um, since we last gathered on September 13th, um, kind of the significant updates that we have with regard to activity around the, the high E funding. Um, <clears throat> as I think we mentioned to you at that time, uh, we were looking ahead to the fall affordable and special needs housing program application round. Um, we were, I think, very pleased with a, a really robust response um, for this fall application round. Um, in total, we um, <clears throat> took in about 29 uh, applications that were seeking high E funding. We were offering 27 million in high E funding. Um, I think at the end of the day, and Willie, I don't want to get ahead of any announcements or anything of that nature, but um, it looks like we're going to be able to award a significant number of projects, um, probably on the order of around 19 projects and about $17 million of high E funding from this fall round. Um, and, and Willie, I don't want to steal any of your thunder, but that's, uh, I think, in general, we don't want to get too far ahead of any announcements, but um, it looks like we had a we had a very robust response. And um, so, is there anything that you wanted to add on that piece? Uh, no, nothing to add. <clears throat> Those, um, and just to share what Dan is um, sharing is kind of internal um, discussion, but um, that has not been finalized. We um, actually. Um, I need to present those findings to the um, uh, leadership team, and then the, they'll they'll be finalized. But um, nothing to add. Okay. Yeah. And I I sorry I didn't want to get too far ahead of anything there, and hope I didn't. Um, so have to ask forgiveness and not permission there. Um, <clears throat> hey Dan. Yeah. Hi Chelsea. Um, I'm just curious. So you said that there was 27 million offered. Um, 19 projects um sets, uh giving out 17 million so that leaves 10 million on the table um could you talk to us or provide a little bit more detail on um why there's an additional 10 million that um won't be allocated chelsea uh, i'll um we we haven't we, we have to go through those decision packages process with the governor's office so we had a i think the main thing i'd say is we had a robust application round and after the governor reviews those and, and we make they determine the final announcement and selections that we'll be able to provide additional details on that. Remembering though that, that the ASNH is designed to have a fall and spring round. So we really, um, there, there's the allocation in, in the fall and spring, but we'll be able to uh, get back and that'll be publicly announced about the, the final amounts as we, um, and, and we, ex, you know, we expect those announcements from the governor's office. Um, at, by the end of December, early in early January, as they um, review everything. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Eric, and thanks for the question, Chelsea. Um, so we'll uh, just moving along here. Um, I think, as everybody knows, the the fourth uh, Reggie auction um, that Virginia participated in took place on December second. Uh, that was um, again. Uh, surprising in the sense that the clearing price or, or the price per ton of carbon went up to $13. Um, um, so the, you know, the take from that was was pretty robust. And um, we have a little bit more detail um, further on in the presentation on that. Uh, but that is the, that was one of the other significant updates. And then uh, we've been, that is DHCD, um, Department of Energy, Virginia Energy, uh, Department of Conservation Recreation, and Department of Environmental Quality have all been working on the first annual report uh, to the Governor's Office and General Assembly as required by uh, SB 1027 uh, and HB 981. Um, <clears throat> and so that is now with, uh, that's in final review with the uh, respective Secretary's Office, uh, SOCT, Commerce and Trade and Natural Resources, and um, that's sort of moving through the final approval process. And, um, um, you know, uh, I think turned out to be a very nice summary and uh, great document with a lot of good information. 
And I think we can have that public uh, as soon as it's approved and um, posted to the HIE webpage. Uh, so uh, I think with that, I'll move along. So in terms of transitioning to 2022, um, you know, again, uh, DHCD will remain uh, mission focused in addressing housing needs, uh, reducing energy burdens in low income households. Um, we don't have a lot of detail for you here, but um, as, as many of you know, Dan, I can, I can take this slide if that's okay for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. So um, thanks again, everyone for the, um, the, the work. And, and one of the things I, I wanted to highlight on this transition slide is that, um, and, and Willie, uh, uh, thanks to his leadership with uh, the National Association working on weatherization, uh, we're trying to stay really in, in tune with the federal infrastructure bill and additional money that's going to be flowing for weatherization through the infrastructure bill. We don't know the amounts precisely at this point, but we will we'll, um, um, be uh, responding back with that information uh, as we as we learn more. But excited about some uh, major plus ups with the infrastructure bill and, and feel free to ask any questions. Willie will do his best with what he knows, but like anything, it's evolving. Um, but I, uh, the main thing I wanted to say on this slide, and next next couple slides, is that uh, you know we're on track with this being our, our final meeting, uh, and then we'll be um, with the group, and then we'll be reconvening um, with post general assembly session, uh, post into the new administration on the priorities related to um, the high E program, and we'll again we'll be having this obligation of the um, ASNH after this round of uh, ASNH included the high E eligibility. Um, so, so, but we will be, um, you know, everyone is aware of the governor's elects announcement on uh, his uh, determination on executive action related to Reggie. And as you all know, we're administrators of the high E funds. We're, we're not involved with um, that component of, of the, the policy decisions over um, the, the source of funds that fund this. So uh, we look forward to working with the governor elect and, and uh, uh, looking to see his, his direction for us as an agency. And we'll, we'll be back in touch on, uh, I know the different questions have been coming in on that, but we don't really have any updates on that. And we'll, we, I'll look forward to meeting the new secretary of commerce and trade and working with the new team on, on uh, what, what the, the future fund sources are. I mean, as you all also know, there are multiple bills that have been filed related to um, utilizing different portions of the Reggie proceeds for things like the common, the community flood preparedness funds. And as as you all are aware, also the and we'll give you some of the, the details for the public and stakeholders later is that uh, the amount of funds is actually growing for um, the the original protection projections by DEQ. At least this most recent round, there. Um, the amount of net proceeds is much higher. So Dan, if you could go to the next slide. So really the, um, as we mentioned, um, it's amazing to think about a year to the day, this group first convened and you all really put a lot of hard work into uh, advising on the utilization and, and creation of uh, the, the three uh, subsets of funds within Reggie proceeds for housing innovations and energy efficiency. Again, we're, next year we're going to streamline to that twice yearly public meeting open to all interested parties. Uh, the timing, again, is going to be around spring or summer after the General Assembly session. We'll have more, more details as uh, uh, the policy discussions and debate uh, at the, uh, and, and the governor's uh, decisions on that uh, get made. And so the, really the decision points would be post that uh, about uh, with our current plan about adjustments to funding allocations and then we'd share any outcomes and updates from the General Assembly and governor's decisions as well. Next slide. So um, the current plan, again, that's subject to change as we as we go through the, um, the transition will is is it before you. Um, as with all programs, you know, the big decisions are the allocation percentages, but then for each sub bucket, we'd have um, guidelines, separate guideline development processes um, that are rolled into it. 
So those, um, those are a couple of the big updates. I want to pause there and see if anyone has had any questions um, or any uh, additional uh, questions for Willie on the, on the federal IHEAP. I know there was a couple in the chat. So um, Elizabeth, I see you have a, a question. Thanks, Eric. Um, so sorry, just thinking through the transition and, and obviously it's a lot remains to be seen there, but is the, as we were talking about the funds currently available, the 27 million earlier, is that um, additional 10 million definitely staying within the, the high E program or is there a possibility that would be moved I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we're, we'll be working to get out information on the obligation from uh, ASNH, and then we'll be, we'll be working with the new administration regarding anything that's not been obligated yet. So, um, so more to come on, on, on that. Okay. Um, and what about the proceeds from the December 2nd auction? Similarly, that could be allocated elsewhere potentially by the new administration yeah I, I don't know the the answer on on um things that are unobligated so we we have the fall round and then the um the the proposed plan for these allocations was both um whether deferral this mm -hmm. this fall round and the spring round um so you know we will have to meet the new um secretariat and and Take from them direction on the on anything that's unobligated if there's determinations on that. Okay, thank you. Hey Eric, based on that, uh, this is follow up from Chelsea. Um, I'm just curious, um, but it, the language it's it's codified. Um, for that 50% of Reggie funds should go to low income energy efficiency housing. Um, but you're saying it could be it, any unobligated funds. You're not sure where, um, what could happen to that? Um, I, I guess, could you speak? I know we're in a gray area here, but could you speak a little bit more to that? Because if it's already codified that it needs to stay, it needs to go to low income energy efficiency. Um, just ignoring anything that could happen during session. Um, what your your thoughts are that it's still a question of whether unobligated funds would go to low income energy efficiency programs. No, I I'm saying that we're we're staying on track as administrators. We've we're working on with the current law and the current um, fall round to to make those announcements and then will be, um, you know, there, but there are discussions in the uh, policy um, bills out there on the Reggie funds and, and that we'll, we'll have to see where things land after the general assembly session on um, if there's any uh, decisions that would not keep us from proceeding. But currently we're, we're still um, on track for, we, we haven't put anything on the ASNH on pause. So I can't speak to the, the uh, legal anything legal about executive determination on the future on this but i but i just um but we're on we're on track for what the current law has asked us to do and and the, the obligations that we're supposed to be making so if i can summarize what i just heard i heard that your statement that unobligated funds that your original statement that unobligated funds might not um it's unclear what will happen with the new administration that statement was based on not knowing what will happen before the General Assembly, not necessarily, or I'll, I'll just leave it there. It's just, that's based on whatever happens at the General Assembly, not outside of what could happen at the General Assembly. Chelsea, I can't speak to the, all, all I can speak to is that we will continue on our current plan and, and be back in touch on the programs that we've already have planned for um, the spring uh, in in the in the spring. So I, I can't speak to the executive versus legislative on this, and 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 I don't think that's our place as, as agency to to weigh in on that. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I saw Carmen and then I think Casey with hands up. Yeah, thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, what I appreciate the position that you're in right now, Eric, trying to uh, remain as an agency head as you are. And um, I commend you for doing that. Um, yeah, so for those that don't understand or are unclear as to the how this works with the new administration, as Chelsea pointed out, it is codified that this is how the monies are supposed to be spent from high E. It, it, but laws change every year. And so depending upon what happens during the General Assembly, things could be different for this program going forward. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just, everything can change from year to year during General Assembly. But as the law is currently written, all of the money that you all are that that has come in that has not been allocated to specific projects basically what we would plan to do assuming no let's let's just talk in a vacuum here assuming no general assembly changes um these monies would roll forward into in their in their uh respective pots to go out for the next to be available for the next round of applications so if you didn't have enough, if you didn't have enough applications to pull out that full $27 million for this fall round, right? Let's just say something, something happened. And even though you may have designated it, one of the contractors fell through or something, you know, just something happened there. And let's just say $5 million wasn't able to be allocated. You would just roll that again. This is in a vacuum without any general assembly changes happening. You would just roll that into the spring. Pot. Is that what? Is that how this would work? Yeah. Currently, nothing's changed with um, right. you know when you all had the allocation of the net proceeds, and we we agreed the and that DHC would create these programs with the projected fifty five million in revenue and use any additional revenue above these amounts to allocate to programs uh, with the most demand at DHCD's discretion in between. So, like we already okay. we'd already we'd always expected that we wouldn't allocate all of the ASNH portion of high E in the fall round. We'd have a fall and spring and make that work with the different, with the ASNH program. So, so we'll be continuing to um, okay. look at the the spring and, and be back in, in touch if there's any changes. Okay. Okay. I just want, I wanted to get clarity on that, but I also have, but that wasn't my question. My question was, um, in terms of moving forward, and again, talking in a vacuum, um, there, there's, <clears throat> there was, there's the, there's, there's two things that are kind of at odds here in my head that I'm not quite sure how this is going to work. You talked about moving forward in 2022 again in a vacuum. Let's assume no general assembly changes. That the, that this group, this advisory group, would no longer need to meet. Like we would be disbanded, so to speak, and that you would only go to allocation uh, meetings after that. But then you talk here on this slide about reconvening for a stakeholders discussion and input on the 23 allocations and feedback on programs. So kind of settle those two for me, because one is saying basically you don't need any more stakeholder input and the other is saying, but you do. So this is just um restating what the stakeholder advisory group we, we agreed to last time and i um, apologize if it wasn't clear the way i stated it but but really we agreed we had an intensive stakeholder advisory group and with set members we believe in stakeholder input for all of our programs and that that never ends so i no, don't want anyone to take that we ever believe in stakeholder input ending um, what we had moved to is away from this appointed group of stakeholder advisory group members to uh, next uh, to the next calendar year doing like we do for many programs where we have two meetings of all stakeholders um, not with set members but with everyone all of you all, all um, and like we've had public input providing written and verbal public input on the allocation pieces for, for next year. And then also um, after that allocation pieces, getting input separately on each of the guideline processes for all, uh, you know, right now, all three sets of programs 
and that always can change in the future. So, so that's that's consistent with what um, we had agreed to last at the last stakeholder group meeting. Um, I hope that clarifies it. Yes, it does. Thank you. I just I my head was not wrapping around the two. Thanks, so, Carmen. They seemed contradictory to me, so thank you. Yeah, I probably didn't say it well. Casey, I see your hand up. Hey, thanks. I'll try to be brief here. Um, thank you all for, for your continued work on this. Um, I'm curious to know what can this group do to advocate for continuation of uh, the Reggie funds in their current programs? And uh, who would be best positioned to lead that charge? Uh, I'm guessing perhaps that would be not DHCD, but um, would welcome feedback there. Um, you know, obviously, I think the annual report is is going to be a great source of some of those metrics and the impact these resources are making in the Commonwealth, um, and look forward to seeing that. Um, I, I guess I'm also thinking through that the weatherization deferral maintenance uh, funds are because they've already been able to go into action, that that's going to be a great storytelling opportunity. Um, but because the affordable special needs housing funds are probably a little bit more in play, um, what could we do to continue to support that work as well and perhaps reach out to the development community for letters of support if that would be helpful? So Casey, I um, appreciate your question. I would just say on that one that, yeah, DHCD as a state agency and civil servants, we, we can't get involved in advocacy for or against anything. And so we're, our job is to implement programs. Um, I, would, I would say for this stakeholder advisory group, the focus here is on the implementation. And so, um, you know, I think the anyone interested in in that kind of discussion, it wouldn't be for this meeting. It would be at a, at a you know, anything that uh, stakeholders. Uh, so, I, so, but I'm sure it's a topic on everyone's mind and, and appropriate to ask. But I, I would ask that um, you all do that without DHCD because that's not a that's not a part of our role. Thank you. Any other questions? Willie, did you have anything you wanted to add on the um, the federal light, uh, some of the federal weatherization updates? Sure. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, so I have been working with um, our partner, National Advocacy Group, just to try to zero in on um, some of the things that we're anticipating will come out of the infrastructure bill. Um, as Eric mentioned earlier, we don't know specific amounts. Um, we've kind of done our, our own internal math and, and figured we may be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 to 65 million that would flow to, to um, Virginia for the weatherization part. The LAHI part numbers are, are much different. Um, and since we're not the direct grantee, I really haven't done a whole lot of analysis on, on that side. What I will say, though, is a couple of key components. Um, one of the key things that we advocated through the national group to avoid was the um, implementation of uh, Davis-Bacon um, to um, uh, apply to that that those funds that would flow through weatherization for infrastructure. Um, the, the outcome was that the Department of Energy was able to negotiate that the Davis-Bacon compliance would only apply in the case of multifamily weatherization, um, which is great news for us and for our network. Um, the last time when we dealt with our funds and you know Davis Bacon was across the board, it it um, it, it created quite a quite a a, a hurdle and, and delay for implementation. So that was one one of the successes. The other thing that I think is key to point out is that um, the way it's structured, there's going to be a uh, a time release. So for those of you who were around when we had uh, the R funds flow, it was you know a bulk of funds that came in and we basically had a three year spend out. And it created a lot of stress, not only on our network, but across the country. Um, the guidance that we've received so far is that the flow of these, fund, these funds will be an incremental release to states. Um, and my guess is there'll probably be some production related um, metrics is that you know, states will have to comply with before they receive uh, you know, a second or third tranche of those funds. Um, and the other piece of that is that the uh, DOE would release some upfront administrative uh, funds to states, understanding that state programs would need to ramp up, um, you know, ex uh, uh, to to uh, be prepared to deliver the funds. So um, those are the key pieces that I can share at this point. Again, it's all still kind of working its way through um, um, Congress and the, the individual agencies. But um, 
And, and you know, as far as the, as I mentioned on the LIHEAP side, since DHCD, our program would not be the direct grantee. It don't have as much, uh, as many specifics there, but, um, you know, we're obviously working with our partners at DSS to figure out what that might look like. Um, so that's all I had to add. Willie, this is Chelsea. I apologize. I'm going to have a lot of questions today. Um, on the uh, weatherization money that's coming specifically, is there an opportunity for that money to follow different guidelines than the current weatherization program, or do you feel that it's going to follow the same exact guidelines? Um, so what I'm thinking about is how, you know, for example, the deferral, the weatherization deferral program is obviously um, providing income and providing money um, to meet a different type of need that the current weatherization program, federal weatherization program, doesn't allow. Um, so in thinking about that, that's where my question is coming from, is just wondering if there's an opportunity for that funding to um, follow, uh, to have a different set of guidelines than the current federal weatherization. So I, I will say this, that 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 broad context that you're speaking in right now was a consideration as part of this. So in the original infrastructure proposal, there was actually a carve out for what um, Congress had defined as a, a uh, um, weatherization readiness fund, I think was the term that was used at the federal level. Um, and, and quite frankly, we advocated for that because we were one of the few states who were able to say that we have kind of already started to get ahead of that game with, you know, through uh, our participation in, in regi funds and we were already looking to, at um, you know bringing homes um, up to weatherization standards. My understanding is, and unfortunately that died in Congress, so that was not included in the final bill. So the final bill is still wrapped around the, the original weatherization legislation at the federal level. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Thanks, sure. Chelsea. Any other questions on the federal infrastructure goal? Okay. I think, um, Dan, I think if you can pull up the slides or Aaron, uh, I think that I'll turn it back. We we're going to just go through some of the updates on the, the allocation amounts. Are the slides back yet? Yep, we can see yep. them. And go ahead and advance, Aaron, from this one. Um, Eric, thank you for, for navigating that part of the discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, again, this is just a recap, and, and you all have seen this slide before. <clears throat> but this is, this is the uh, <clears throat> allegation or obligation of the fiscal year 21 um, high E funding, so that March auction, uh, the 21.7 million, as you can see here, this is how um, roughly those funds have been allocated, 21.1 million uh, to 15.2 to weatherization deferral repair, uh, 5.9 million to um, the successful um, ASNH projects from the uh, fall round, I'm, I'm sorry, from the spring round. Um, Housing Innovation Partnership Grants, and um, we'll discuss that a little bit uh, further um, in, in the agenda here. Um, so Aaron, if you want to move to the next slide. And I think we've agreed that this was sort of a reasonable allocation um, going forward, looking at the fiscal year 22. Um, again, you know, I think as Eric mentioned earlier, the projected available funds were, um, you know, the net revenue has been significantly higher, um, but generally speaking, this is what we were looking at um, with that $55 million um, projected availability um, that we would sort of flip these and, and allocate 30% to the weatherization deferral repair program going forward and 60% to the ASNH program. Uh, now, I think based on some comments that we got from the public comment period for the housing innovation partnerships grant partnership grants program um, we uh, we would like to rebrand that to housing innovation housing energy efficiency partnership grants um, but again this is something that we'll have to um, reevaluate going forward um, in, in terms of a new program a new allocation um, so, and if, if you go ahead and move forward, um, 
just just for information, this is public information, but um, basically these were the net proceeds, the 50% net programs from the June, September, and December auctions. Um, so um, generally speaking, this is uh, in the neighborhood of, of $90 million. Um, and so um, significantly above the 55 that was projected way back when. So, um, I think I'll pause there and see if anybody has any, I, I think I did see a hand go up, um, Carmen. Yep, sorry. I, I, no problem. <laughs> I was going to ask you this question, but I'm glad it was the next slide. But just for clarification and just to make sure everybody understands this. So you pro we there was a projection of 55 million for those three quarters for the rest of the fiscal year 21 and then uh, the first quarter of 22. We we've actually got to date 90 is that right 90 what was the number again yes um roughly speaking that's yeah <clears throat> yeah 92 million roughly. i can't do the math in my head but i know yeah. i was just doing it myself. It's, it's 92 million yep 92 thank you <laughs> thank you um so 92 million so the way just so everybody understands this the way this now works is we have the 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 project what we projected would be out of the 55 million uh allocated to the specific buckets and then that would mean that the additional hold on i'm going to do the math real quick 37 million would be allocated um according to the need so yeah so what you know in so in the next calendar year the next things coming up would be ASNH and the HEAP grant um, in sometime into calendar year 2022. And then we'd have to see demand on those programs under the current, um, you know, current allocation method. Right. Okay. Awesome. But, but the, but you wouldn't, it, it really is based on the demand. So let's say you've got a projected 33 million on the ASNH and let's say you're looking at maybe 45 million for that next round then that would still leave um you know 22 that would still leave another 15 million that might be allocated somewhere else like it it, it all depends upon what how those projects come in the applications come in you could have some innovation projects that might come in and would be more than that five and a half and so some of that could all go to that if possible but but again you have that discretion to determine if you have applications come in and the allocation, and it, which means that the percentage allocations would be different than what we initially said, but it's only on that, uh, it's only because of that additional revenue that we've gotten. Yeah, well, given the, the larger amount above the 55 million, when we come out with any future mm -hmm availability of funds, we'd make it clear what the new availability amount would be and then, you know, what the decision points would be. And then and then we have that discretion above the percentages to go above um, if there's demand for different programs. So that'll be, a, you know, calendar year 2022 once we see the demand on things in the spring there. So, so, so are you splitting the full projected amount by the allocation percentages first and then switching buckets around or are you just going with what you projected taking in all the applications based on that and then if there are additional needs then going to the additional revenue that's what i'm I, i'm sorry that's how i should have stated it stated it in the first place what i'm trying to decide is trying to determine is you know is is the allocation percentage going to apply to the entire bucket first and then move anything around above, you know, after that allocation, or do you just stick with the fit, with the original projected amount? Do your application rounds based on that projected amount, and then whatever you know, if something comes in above that, then you can take that extra pot of money and apply it to those additional applications. Yes, yeah, so I think I think we would have 
the discretion to do that either way. What we were okay. on doing was using the percentage that y'all had originally originally okay. taken at the spring rounds. But in uh -huh. in the end, it kind of works out the same way because we don't right. we don't know the total demand for those right. programs moving in. So, bottom yeah. line is we have enough more than enough funds for all three pots of what projected demand we we anticipate. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's just it sometimes that depends. I mean, if I was a developer what I would propose would depend upon how much money is going to be available in the pot. Cause I could start with a smaller project versus a larger project. If I know there's going to be more money available. So how are you basing those applications? You know, when you're, when you're putting out those, those requests for applications, you know, how are those being stated in terms of what, you know, what, what people would know would be available for funding. Yeah, we'll, we'll, um, we will make sure we, take that under strong consideration as we put out any future RFPs guidelines about mm -hmm. making sure we're clear with folks how much is available. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think you can keep going, oh, Dan. Yeah. So I think we're doing pretty well on time um, in order to uh, wrap up by 11. Um, so, Aaron, if you want to advance to the next slide, I think we've touched on this already. Um, and again, you know, these were the this uh, spring ASNH round. Um, you know, we we're able to obligate five point nine million dollars to eleven projects. Um, that encompasses over seven hundred units of um, affordable housing that will either be newly built or preserved through a substantial renovation. Um, meeting the high EU requirements. Again, we've touched on the fall round here um, and uh, those approvals as um, Eric and Willie referenced will be announced soon. Um, so moving into, uh, moving ahead to a little more detail on the weatherization deferral repair program. Aaron, if you could advance the slide. <clears throat> So again, as we mentioned, that that is the uh, the 15.2 million was um, obligated by agreement to the weatherization agencies. Um, we, uh, you know, that that was the pipeline in terms of of deferred units. Um, you know, it was roughly a thousand, a little more than a thousand. Um, we launched the program on or around July 1st, um, and uh, we have now gotten robust participation. Almost all the agencies have now either completed projects or have projects in the pipeline. Um, there are 46 projects that have been completed. Um, those are predominantly single family, but we do have some small multifamily projects that have been completed. Um, you know, about $850,000 has been out, is out the door and invoiced to those projects. Um, we have a, a, a large pipeline, 154 additional projects, about 1.6 million in estimated repair costs. Um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, that pipeline is sort of building, it's growing on, on a daily basis. Um, we are continuing to reach out to the agencies that are, have, have not yet submitted projects, and there are only a couple, but um, you know, I think we're, we're reaching out and making sure that they recognize this as an opportunity, walking them through the process. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing pretty much across the board, um, all, all the weatherization agencies jumping in and, um, and starting to work on those, those deferrals. Um, so I think the performance pool, if it, if it comes to pass, um, that's another possibility where if the agency spends down all of their WDR funds within the program year, um, they could reach out to us and we could probably, you know, we could quickly add some additional funding to their agreement so that they can continue with their pipeline. Um, the flip side of that is that if they are not able to spend all, all of the money within the program year, um, we've, we've let them know that they will be able to roll that over into their subsequent program year. Um, Okay, so Carmen, I see you got your hand back up. Oops, sorry. I feel like Chelsea now. I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. Uh, actually, no. I just clarification. Uh, again, the the money the for the WDR the the uh, weatherization deferral repair. Um, again, 
this money was allocated, just for clarification, this money was allocated to weatherization providers who requested it, not necessarily a blanket allocation to all weatherization providers, correct? Yeah, that's correct, Carmen. It was based on the the um, the, the agency providing their sort of um, best estimate of the deferrals that they had mm -hmm. in their service area mm -hmm. um, multiplied by the estimated repair cost, depending what the nature of the repair or the issue was. Okay. In those okay. So, yeah. so, so then the expectation is, is that these weatherization providers are actually uh, using the money and therefore it's more likely that they might need more money as they discover more homes while they're weatherizing than actually roll over unless, unless they have issues. Right. Um, but the expectation is, is that they're going to use all their money. Yeah, I'd like to refer to Willie too, um, because it does take a while to get pipeline built up in the space. So the mm -hmm. obligations there, and then so you'd expect that it it takes a while for them to ramp that up. Um, so mm -hmm. what, Willie, do you have anything to add on this? Sure. One? The only other thing I would add to that is, <clears throat> um, so Carmen, what you've outlined is accurate, um, and the other piece of this is that we are working specifically with a handful of of our weatherization providers. Um, who have targeted some some fairly large projects, and those are taking and, and some of these are multifamily. Which you know, one of the things we've talked about for years is we haven't been able to adequately serve multifamily given um, a lot of the the um, limitations on the broader funding. So, with that said, the, the, your your question is correct. Plus, we we have some um, uh, projects that we know that are in the pipeline that are going to make a substantial dent. And yes, we have allowed the organizations to identify those. We're not just across the board, um, you know, handing out funds, so. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chelsea, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, just a couple of clarifying questions um, and a comment. Uh, first, it says um, 1, 000, the 1,064 homes dwelling units deferred. Is that, um, can you be a little bit more specific? Is that just this year um, or is that over a, a time time span um it's a good question chelsea there were um, some agencies that just sort of provided a you know just sort of a blanket these are the number of homes or units deferred and then there were some that sort of broke it out by year that they thought it'd be feasible to get to those um but it so but to carmen's point there are you know new audits and and new deferrals being added so you know so they're um new new potential clients to serve coming in um, as we speak. So Definitely. Me, I was just curious if that was just from those were deferred units just this year or from many previous years. No. So uh, Chelsea, and I'll, I'll add to that. W one of the, the things that um, you know, I want to stress is prior to the, the availability and access to these funds, the state did not have a formalized process for tracking deferrals. And so a big piece of this, this bringing this program online, it has been DHCD establishing a, a more defined um, and set of criteria to identify those deferrals. So within that, we, again, because there were no funds available prior to these funds, we allowed, we requested that the agencies kind of maintain those at a, at a local level. And that happened in, in very, you know, very different ways. Um, but since the implementation of this program, we have now have a more formalized process. So that, that, that number, is a combination of reaching out to organizations before the funds existed and says, you know, tell us what you have on your records and what we have been able to formalize since these funds have become available. So um, I think that we're, we've made a lot of um, progress in, again, having that one <clears throat> standardized system that we can all track. But to answer your question, that, that number is kind of a, a, a configuration of what existed prior to the structure of this program and what we've been able to um, solidly identify since this uh, uh, implementation of funds. Great. Um, and then do you have this data broken down by geographic region? That would be really helpful. Um, Chelsea, we, we don't have it. Um, well, we can, um, you know, we do have, we do are able to track it by provider and service area. Um, just for purposes of today, we just rolled it up um, to, to give you a sense of the of, of the bigger picture. 
Yeah, it is possible to either break it up, um, break it up by provider or um, geographic region, you know, Northern Virginia, Central, Southwest, um, either one I think would be really helpful, um, particularly to those of us that are um, more oriented on the policy side and will be paying very much a, a lot of attention to um, uh, what's happening during General Assembly. That'd be really helpful. Um, and then, you know, I, I do just want to point out that this looks like it's only about 2.3 million of the 15.2 million that um, has been spent or already is in the pipeline. Um, and we do only have about six months left of the fiscal year. Um, and also, I see the I see in the chat at least CHP it looks like they have um, they have a plan for spending a, a lot. I and I I totally understand needing time to ramp up. It takes a long time to ramp up a program. Um, I don't. I was just curious: is DHC providing resources, or is there something that can be done to help other providers who might be struggling um, with their capacity to ramp up? Um, is there something, you know, advisory committee members could, could do, um, but we do only have six months left in the year. And if we've only spent, um, you know, 2.3 of 15.2 million, that, that is a big concern. So I would just add that <clears throat> one, their um, DHCD is working and interacting regularly with the weatherization network. Um, the other piece, and, and so so capacity TA is kind of coming through through that component. The other piece is, um, you know, there have been some broader um, exploration of strategies. For example, um, you know, the the old process of or when you look at single family homes of basically responding to inquiries from um, you know individuals in need has been kind of one. You know, that that's been the traditional method um, of the weatherization program. Since the availability of these funds have come out, what we've been um, working with a number of our providers, again, we knowing that capacity is probably never going to be equal amongst all 17. Some of our providers have the capacity, for example, to go out and not just try and identify individual properties, even on a multifamily scale, but now they've kind of opened some pipelines with more directly with um, property management companies who are managing multiple properties. And so there, there's a number of strategies that are being employed to help um, advance that capacity within the network. Um, but again, you know, the, the, the reality of, you know, a small community action agency, a larger nonprofit housing developer and, and the capacity differences there, that's, that's a, a consistent thing that we've acknowledged and we've been trying to work with some of those smaller organizations on how to build that through the subcontract network, et cetera. Um, so hopefully I'm answering your question, but I wanted to give you a sense that there, there is capacity building assistance coming through DHCD in helping organizations think through what their capabilities are and what potential strategies they can pursue to increase that, um, that, that targeted network. Great, thank you, that's helpful. And I think the last data point that I would request is I, I'm curious about um, what is the price tag per, uh, what is an average price tag per project? Obviously that's going to be different for single family versus multifamily. And it's probably going to be, you know, a, a ballpark. Obviously you can't just pinpoint a single one, but that, that just might be a helpful data point as well. Um, you know, to help tell the story of, um, you know, how this money is being used. Good point. Good point. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm just following on that, what Willie had said, you know, I think it's um, kudos to the weatherization team as well. Um, I think that the WDR team and the weatherization team are working really well together. Um, you know, it's important that we are coordinating so that there's a handoff of these projects once the weatherization or the deferral work is done so that the weatherization work can get done. And I think there's also been really good coordination on the multifamily projects. Um, so I think this is this is where you know in terms of increasing capacity um this is another area where you know our our, our teamwork internally is helping to really uh, facilitate this process and move forward with some of the multifamily projects which are a little more complex um typically than the than the single family projects so
All right, anything else on the WDR program before we move along? All right. So um, I think, Willie, we've already put you on the spot a lot today, um, weatherization, but um, any, any additional detail here that you could flesh out for us? Um, the only thing I guess that we haven't covered is um, we are uh, the, the current RFP for to fill the, the um, I forget what the total number of counties is, uh, citizen counties that are vacant right now due to um, the um, crater district area agency on aging leaving the program and Telemann um, Corporation um, its strategic decision to to concentrate its services in North Carolina, which is where it's headquartered. And so that is open, that RFP is open, um, I, not the proper term RFP, that application, I forget what the proper term I'm supposed to use is, but that's open through, um, we gave it 30 days, I think it's through January 7th, I believe. Um, don't quote me on that, but it's it's in DHCD's camp system. You can go in and, and identify the, the uh, scope of that. Um, and so our objective there is to get um, an entity up and running um, as quickly as possible to serve. We DHCD has been collecting um, uh, uh, referrals from anyone in that region um, who is currently going, going without services. Um, we've communicated with all the local officials in each of those um, elected officials in each of those um, targeted service areas. Um, and so we hope to have that in place, given, again, those broad federal rules by the middle of uh, January. We, we tend to have a new provider serving that region. Willie, real quick, could you just, for people that are not familiar, the the general area of where these two service areas are? You would ask that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if maybe Nancy's on the line. She probably knows them uh, off the top of her head. I, I'd have to look them up. So why don't I do that and I can come back and, and tell you what that is. Okay. I, can, I can tell you where they are. Oh, it's, yeah, uh, it's the Petersburg, Hopewell, Dinwiddie, Nottoway, Lunenburg, um, Mecklenburg, down in that, that area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And then uh, just we'll mention the third Whoop. Well, anyway. Third bullet there was um, work in DHCD, Project Homes, um, USDA and others are um, have convened and there's sort of a multi-agency effort on um, serving the Eastern Shore and um, some of the, tan the, the challenges in serving Tangier Island. Um, but we are having those conversations and um, I think at least the initial uh, one was, was very uh, productive. And so I think we'll continue to uh, forge that partnership uh, going forward. And Dan, um, again, for those that are unaware, may be newer to Virginia than some of the rest of us, Tangier Island is an island that is in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, and it is a Virginia um, island. Yes. All right. Um, hey, Dan, I can I can wrap us up on this one if, you, if that's yes, okay. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was just a wrap up slide of what we've discussed before, but you, you know, we don't, um, we, we wanna make sure some of the big decision points obviously are next spring, um, but we wanted to make sure we had some time at the end for any additional discussion and then uh, and then from the work group first. And then if there's any public comment, we have, um, there's some comments in the chat from, from different, um, stakeholders or partners but um so we'll just open it up at this point for any uh, additional discussion and and then um look forward to um talking again about the um, the next steps next year so this is carmen i know i've spoken a lot and i apologize if anybody feels like i'm monopolizing it but um I, in terms of the the allocation, I think Chelsea hit on it, and I didn't quite hear a, a, a solid answer that would satisfy folks that I know that would be asking the question. 
when we're looking at the allocations for next year's, this kind of runs into, so we have the, the, the 15.2 or whatever, yeah, 15.2 from the spring round on the, on the WDR, the weatherization deferrals. But according to the stats that were given us, we only look at like, we're looking at 2.3 million that has actually been out, like shot out the door or, or no, 850 has been out the door. That's actually been paid with another one and a half million um, that is allocated. So where is like, how is the rest of that money planned to be spent and when? So the, I do want to clarify, you know, that 15.2 million, um, mm -hmm. that is a typical, you know, in a fiscal year, the first quarter on, especially when you're starting something like that, it's typical that it starts slow and ramps near the end of the fiscal year. I mean, all of our rehab programs, um, you know, it kind of has that curve in, in essence. So it's all the 15.2 million is obligated and that's what sets in motion the pipeline on the okay so i think i think some clarification in your stats on that would be good i think instead of just showing that you've got 154 projects that have 100 you know 1.58 million there needs to be that additional and there's 13 million worth of projects that are still or whatever the amount is that have been obligated but are not yet um i don't know what the right word is then yeah we, we can obligated we can but not allocated or allocated but not obligated not allocated maybe that's the same word i don't know I, there I needs to be that additional stat in there i definitely hear you on that i think the key we put at the first bullet point is the 15.2 million has been obligated to the the cut through contracts with the weatherization network and then we're just reporting out on the spend deadline um, through the year on the projects they're completing, but, but we can try to, uh, be more clear about that that's obligated and that they're working on the project pipelines under their contract period. So their contract period wasn't to get, you know, a certain percentage done by now, it was to get right. it done by the end of the year. And the best practice in these kind of programs is to have that incentive pool so that when you have a provider who's really getting a lot done, we can continue the effort and continue the contractor working there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think some clarification on those numbers would be really, really helpful. Um, I think just simply moving the bullet points um, to have the 15.2 million and then the eight, 842,000 invoiced and the pipeline directly under that or a subcategory of that mm -hmm. would, would clarify that. Because you really have obligated all of the funds. Yeah. And that could be even a, a, a rolling number in terms of like, to date, 46 projects have been completed. There are 154 projects to date, you know, whatever the date is, because those numbers are going to be updated as you go along. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's helpful. Um, yeah, and just just so the, the the 154 projects are the projects that the agencies have uploaded in CAMS. Mm -hmm. So these are already the audits have been done. The you know the before photos have been taken. Um, these are the projects that we are in the process of approving to move forward, and they are continually coming in on a daily basis. Yeah. So that that pipeline is increasing. Perfect. On, on a daily basis. Yep. Yeah. 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 Thank I, you. I that clarification is good. Yeah, Carmen, your, your, your comments are, are well taken. Um, yeah. Just like you saw in the chat where we know CHP, for example, has 7 million lined up. You're right. We, we need to find a way to ensure that when someone looks at this, they know that this money is committed. Um, and then when you want to talk about where we are at July 1st, January 1st, whatever, then that's a, that's a different discussion. That point taken. So I think Narissa has her hand up next. Yes, and I think to some extent you may, you you've already answered this, but I just wanted to put a a finer point on I think what I'm hearing you say, which is even though those numbers in that prior slide only shows about uh, somewhere around o over two million dollars worth of projects, but that that's just a reflection of where they are in this process. So like they've been they've had sort of that audit done, they're in the system, but there are other projects that 
necessarily you can't account for because they have not made it that far in the process. Is that what I'm hearing? That is correct, yep. Thank you. Um, so I, I will speak to the question that Carrie has in the chat here. Um, I think we had um, Line Virginia Tech up for a presentation today, but given, I think we, we wanted to sort of make this um, opportunity more about hearing from you all and, and sort of open it up for conversation today. Um, and I so we'll uh, bring the Virginia Tech group back um, for a future presentation. Um, I think they will be also um, closer to being uh, finished up with the work um, in terms of their um, both the compiling the data that are needed for the GIS mapping and having the GIS maps prepared. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry to, that we didn't have them for you today, but we felt like that the conversation was was really sort of paramount that needed to take place today. So, so um, yeah, and I just add, and I think, you know, we can provide updates uh, uh, by email, an update on the HIE webpage, kind of where, where that project is, and then have that information for the, the spring when we're, you know, looking at the allocation. Okay. Um, a comment on that mapping uh, presentation. Uh, this, you know, Chelsea hit on this before in terms of seeing where these projects are, but I think it also um, is imperative to answer the questions about equity and where these projects are actually located um, across the state uh, in, and in what communities. And so I think it's really important that we get this information sooner rather than later. I don't know what the what the timeline is for the the consultants, but you know, I was really hoping to see something today on that that could give us a better idea of where where these funds are being concentrated because that is part of the whole Reggie process is making sure that there is equity and that the 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 communities that are being um, where these projects are are communities that are most in need, basically. So uh, I'd rather not delay it too much. I don't know how much longer the, the mapping group needs, but you know, I'd hate to try and put another meeting on just before General Assembly, but I think it would be important to see that. We can we can circle back, we'll circle back to the team and, and give you any updates by email on where, where the mapping project is in the timeline. That'd be great, thank you. So Dan, I know we're getting close to um, public comment period. Is there any other stakeholder advisory group uh, member that had any uh, questions before we open up to a public comment? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was on mute. So I saw Carrie and then Narissa. Thanks, Dan. I um, appreciate the, the update today and all of the complexity here. Um, great to see things moving forward and uh, regarding the mapping, I, I think it's really helpful for everyone to know that, you know, as part of the interagency environmental justice working group, there's a lot of discussion around mapping and different layers that can provide transparency around uh, different aspects of how the Commonwealth is working with either environmental justice communities as defined um, or HEDC communities as defined, obviously energy burdens, um, you know, the components of this program um, are very tangible pieces that have a lot of data um, that goes into that. And so to whatever extent there can be some level of um, kind of cross communication um, to, uh, you know, work with the other interagency groups um, or, or agency groups that are, are um, developing their own maps, I think would be helpful. Um, and certainly for this program, I would love to see uh, both the intersection of where their deferrals, um, as well as where the project's being located, um, and then the the energy burden piece as, so I, I think that's where you guys are going, but it's, um, I'll be curious to see kind of the next step and uh, happy to talk in the interim uh, if there's if there's a, a need to coordinate in between. 
So appreciate it and, and thank you for all your work. Thanks, thank Carrie. You. I see Larissa has her hand. Yeah, I just have a clarifying question about this, just what I see on this slide. So the first is just for my own benefit, the housing energy efficiency partnerships, that's what we were referring, previously referring to as the HIP program, right? So we've officially retitled it. And I know we haven't spent a lot of time talking about it since we did, we decided not to allocate any funds to it in this first year. Um, but I see that you say that there's not going to be any updates until after the summer session. I'm going to assume that's a strategic decision. Um, and so does that mean that we likely won't have any information on when we'll actually start accepting applications until that point? Like what, what are we supposed to be expecting in the spring after General Assembly on this piece in particular? What should I expect? Yeah, just an update on the, um, the program and uh, the timeline about the next steps. I mean, we're, that's a new program for us. So we're taking some time to really make sure we get that right. And we had some input on it. And so we'll be back in touch beginning of the year on the next steps there. And, and um, anyone who's really especially interested in that, we, uh, we'd welcome, you know, any additional thoughts as we as we give updates on that at the beginning of the year. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Eric, as you mentioned, to keep it on schedule here, um, we wanted to open it up to um, other public comments, any other stakeholders that are on the call, if you'd like to raise your hand or unmute, um, try to keep it brief. Um, We have Chris Meyer and, and Chris with the everyone with the public comments. We'll try to keep it under two minutes, and and um, in the interest of time, we'll just we'll just receive all that input and not respond, so we can make sure we we get to everyone who has public comments. So Chris first. Yes, thanks, and um, thank you for providing these updates uh, regarding what I guess now is the housing innovation or energy efficiency program grants. Um, we appreciated the opportunity to offer some comments on the draft RFP. I will have to say I'm a bit disappointed that I'm learning today, if I understand correctly, and based on your response to Narissa, that you're not going to be releasing the RFP until after the General Assembly. Um, I think this was an important opportunity for a lot of folks who cannot participate in the weatherization, the WDR, the WAP program, or the ASNH to be able to provide services to all geographies, different housing types, et cetera, utilizing different delivery partners um, like municipalities and others. Uh, I think we're missing a huge opportunity by not accelerating the deployment of that grant. And I would, and it could be seen as your, you know, preferential to your existing programs rather than again offering up opportunities to again, utilize new partners and do different things um, with this this funding anyway so i would hope and i would encourage uh, dhc to review promptly the the comments and get that rfp out so that we can get this money deployed and start uh, assisting low-income households and reducing their energy burdens and again mitigating climate change in a more accelerated manner thank you Thank you, Chris, for your for your input. Is there anyone else in the public comment? Um, I see AECP. That, that's a uh, that's Billy. Billy. Billy, go ahead. You're on mute, Billy. You have to unmute. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. I just wanted to reinforce the fact that uh, the weatherization programs are working really hard to um, make this WDR program work and, and to really emphasize that the process that DHCD has set up is working well. Um, you know, and I hear from programs every day you know, it's working well, things are improving, contractors are becoming more. Sorry. 
contractors are becoming more available, more accessible. The supply chain issues are improving. So things are getting better. And uh, there's a lot of money that needs to be spent. I understand that. But as far as the process that's been set up, it's working really well. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thanks for your input, Billy. Any other public comment? Okay, so we'll see, see none. Uh, Dan, was there anything else that you wanted to add before we uh, ended? And thanks everyone for the really, the time and the efficiency of uh, discussion today. We, we ended ahead of time. So anything last that uh, Dan, you wanted to make sure to share? Nope, I, I think we're good. I appreciate everybody's time and, and efforts and input on this. And um, we'll, we'll get back with you with more information very soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you guys.